so they've released the footage of the wreckage they found of the Titan sub. So we're going to take a look at how it failed, along with the core reasons of why it ended up there. The irony of an unsinkable ship called the Titanic sinking on its maiden voyage takes one hell of a dark turn when you realize that as it was sinking, its designer must have realized that he spent the last years of his life designing and building his own iron coffin. All because someone wanted to cut some safety rules and do something faster than anyone else. And while going fast pushed the safety envelope, the thing that cost the most lives was the lack of lifeboats. After all, what's the point in putting lifeboats on an unsinkable ship? After which laws were passed about lifeboats. You know, there's this old saying that safety rules are written in blood. And almost surreally, over a hundred years later, virtually the same story plays out again. Not with the Titanic, but with the Titan. At some point, safety just is pure waste. I mean, if you just want to be safe, don't get out of bed. Don't get in your car. Don't do anything. Complete with the designer having spent the last years of his life making his own carbon fiber coffin. Recording the entire assembly process along the way. Oh yeah, so that will be the pressure vessel for Cyclops too. His thoughts about breaking the rules is really about thinking outside the box and coming up with innovative solutions. Yeah. At some point you're gonna take some risk and it really is a risk reward question. I said, I think I can do this just as safely by breaking the rules. When it goes to 4,000 meters, and be the only one out there. I'm gonna be the first guy in the sub, so we will see. I think it was General MacArthur said, you're remembered for the rules you break. And, you know, I've broken some rules to make this. I think I've broken them with, with logic and good engineering behind me. The carbon fiber and titanium, there's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. Now, footage has just been released of what they actually found of the wreckage of the Titan. So a year or so ago, I made some predictions about how I thought the Titan sub would have failed. So let's see how those predictions square up against what they actually found. Now, my first thought was what caused this was differential expansion. The easiest way to understand this is to bond some glass to some metal at a few hundred degrees Celsius. The join is perfectly sound when it solidifies at about um, 700 degrees Celsius, that sort of thing. Okay. Well, uh, did I actually have a nice seal? But as it starts to cool down to room temperature, the metal wants to shrink more than the glass, which puts a huge strain on the now solid glass joint. Now the thing is that the glass actually, there, uh, hear that? So that's what happens when one to surface contracts more than the other. And yeah, it gets quite hard to actually can to keep a join between the two surfaces. Well, you get a very similar effect when you squeeze things. The only difference being is that rather than differential thermal expansion, you're looking at differential compressibility. You know, how much things shrink when you squeeze them. So when you try and squeeze carbon fiber, it shrinks more than if you put the same squeezing force on, say, for instance, titanium. Now, that's a big problem when you've got a join between the two, because the diameter of the titanium wants to be bigger than the diameter of the carbon fiber tube. The carbon fiber and titanium, there's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. If you take a look at the compressibilities, you expect at those sorts of depths, the carbon fiber tube to want to be about a centimeter smaller than the titanium ring bit. That's roughly how thick the blue line is there. And held together by glue, I'm honestly stunned it survived any dives. Now, once you have a failure, it's not really the pressure that kills you. Just like the titanium and the carbon fiber composite actually get squeezed under pressure, the same is true of the water down there. The whole thing about water not being compressible not technically true. The nearest metaphor that I can give you is, here is a nice little spring. It's, you know, I put small amounts of force on it and it changes its length by a lot. Here is a block of zirconium. 
where I can also push my finger on the top of it, it's actually exactly as reversibly compressible as the spring. It's just, it's a much, much, much stiffer spring. And it turns out it's that springiness that is actually what's going to kill you in the event of a hull rupture. Water at 1,000 atmospheres, which is give or take the pressure at the deepest parts of the ocean, the water is compressed by about 4%. So here we have two cubes, one of which has 4% less volume than the other. Can you tell which one's which? Well, just to prove one is actually genuinely smaller than the other, I'm going to move one inside the other. So the one on the right there would be seawater at the surface. And if you were to take that exact volume of seawater and take it down to the deepest part of the ocean, it would look like the one on the left. And if you think it doesn't look like much, turns out this is what's going to kill you. But yeah, you take the pressure off that thing and give it something to expand into, say, for instance, like a submarine and it'll expand into that at about the speed of sound in a liquid. Give or take 10 times the speed of sound in a gas, which is give or take 10 times the speed of a bullet, which led to this is the prediction of what happened to the Titan and what they would find. Yeah, hear that? A pinhole leak, which would rapidly widen due to the rapid ingress of the water, further widening the crack and the rapid flooding of the sub in probably a fraction of a second. And when that water hammer hits the end of the sub, it's likely that the sub broke into pieces. It's a mind-blowingly simple explanation based around the most likely failure points. And it looks nothing, nothing like this. As for what they actually found, well, the back of the sub fell off more or less just like I predicted, as did the front. The rapid ingress of water, however, does seem to have shredded the central portion of the carbon fiber tube. Now, it turns out in their recent hearings, they actually had a previous hull that they had pressure tested like this. And when it came back up, they found all sorts of delaminations in it. That's basically the carbon fiber wasn't a continuous block anymore, but was basically separated into layers. That I was given by the engineering director, which came from this, these cutoff sections. And please look at the state of it. There were so many delaminations, so many voids, it was like porous paper. So what you probably had was this stressed titanium carbon fiber joint failing rapidly that led to the rapid ingress of water on the failure point that just ripped off this delaminated carbon fiber tube, eventually so progressing down the sub like this, shredding up a significant portion of the hull of the sub and the contents of the sub in that little bit at the end there. Now, if you take a look at the actual report, it's kind of dismissive about the idea of it failing on the ring like this, where they have lots of engineering models that say it wasn't that stressed. Look, the uh, carbon fiber tube marrying to the ring inside the titanium is almost completely unstressed, saying that initial linear results indicate no danger of collapse. Detailed analysis will be in the report with an additional line saying insufficient data to evaluate the glued joints. I know from experience from glass metal joints that if those things don't expand in unison, or in this case get compressed in unison, and they don't, you know what the outcome's going to be. This thought is amplified when you actually take a look at the rings that they recovered. Now, the nature of the joint was something called a C channel, which is basically the ring of the carbon fiber is inserted inside a groove in the titanium. It will be the pressure vessel for Cyclops 2. It'll go to 4,000 meters, It'll be the deepest diving carbon fiber. But when you take a look at the rings that they recovered, they're completely sheared off on that C ring. And on the end that failed, all the glue has been stripped. I mean, for me, this is such an absolute no-brainer that this is how it failed, that, you know, I was kind of curious as to whether I just misread this and they just hadn't bothered to label the photo that they'd actually cut the ring off, until I found this testimony in the hearing. I saw it as it came up and went on the deck, literally. I got the, you know, I was literally positioning them on the deck at times from to tie it down. And the things that I saw on that uh, gave me reason to believe that I, I, I feel I know where the failure was and that the failure happened at the forward 
glue line at the ring. That this is how I think the failure happened is why that that glue line failed. Cyclic fatigue of the glue. When there was not enough glue line, there was not enough support by that titanium edge on the inside to, uh, to maintain the pressure integrity. And it had to have happened equally all the way around that ring because on the forward ring, on the very inside, that inside tab, go out and look at it, touch it, run your hand across it. It has been sheared off completely all the way around inward. The only way that would happen is if it all happened at once. If it happened partially at some place, it would have ripped and tore and then equalized in there. And this other piece, the other remaining piece of that material would stay intact. But that is not the case. It is on the aft end, but not on the forward end. That thing was sheared off smooth. I, I feel I know where the failure was. Seeing how the, how the media had like a field day with misinformation and speculation and uh, downright completely wrong approaches. We're now getting a look at how that implosion happened. In this video obtained by Fox 5 and created by Brad Perry of Starfield Studio, you can see a simulation of what possibly took place due to the high amount of pressure causing the sub to crumble in about 30 milliseconds. Field day with misinformation and... Now a few larger pieces of the hull did survive and when they were raised, they analyzed them. This is an image of a single layer piece of the hull that was retrieved from the ocean floor. Here's a macro scale image of the cut piece. The next slide is at higher magnification and shows the composite plies in greater detail. Now you gotta be a bit careful with the survivor bias here, with the classic example being plotting up the bullet holes on the planes that survived raids in World War II. And you might obviously think, well, we need more armor around the bits with bullet holes. Whereas in reality, of course, you want more armor around the bits with no bullet holes because those planes didn't return. Likewise, you have to be a little cautious about directly inferring the mechanism of the failure from the parts of the sub that survived. Nonetheless, it's clear that there were problems with delaminations in the carbon fiber. In between the plies, there were thin layers of resin that contained porosity. A higher magnification image on the right of the slide illustrates this point. But maybe more interesting is when they cut this cross section, it looked very much like when it did fail, the crack propagated around from one side. That is, after the initial failure, the progression of the failure followed the cracks in the carbon fiber. And that's how the Titan ended up looking like this. But yeah, I can't say that Stockton Rush didn't have skin in the game here. He bet his life on this. And it's not that illogical when you realize that the last 10 or so dives that the sub made to Titanic type depths, it came back fine. He was the one proving the critics wrong. The carbon fiber and titanium, there's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. So I think it's fair to say that he believed it or was sufficiently committed to the lie that he really wasn't in a position to be making objective decisions about safety. Now, humans are funny creatures in that, you know, hundreds of nameless people die in atrocious war zones around the world every day, and no one bats an eyelid. Or if you're not another form of transport, about a hundred people in America die on the roads every day. Five rich people get stuck in a missing sub, maybe with a ticking clock, and hundreds of thousands, millions blown on rescue efforts, along with non-stop media coverage, including people like myself, who use this to explain things like the compressibility of liquids. But there are other important lessons here too, about how we're just claiming that you're innovative and thinking outside of the box. We always called ourselves SpaceX for the oceans. In reality, probably means you need a sane third party for oversight. Person, he also struck me as a very savvy engineer. Elon's doing the same thing at SpaceX. You know, the regulations written in the blood of previous accidents and that simply opining that your innovation is going to save mankind. 
think the same thing's gonna happen going underwater. It's gonna get less expensive and much more accessible. That's where we're gonna have cities, and that's mm -hmm. where people are gonna be. They're gonna be down there exploring. To me, we'll have cities underwater before <gasps> we have them uh, up, up in space. On the moon? Yeah. Ah, yes, under the sea, where windows cost a mere $7,000 each. If you think about the Earth as really the landmass that we all occupy, then there are three planets worth of resources available in the ocean. And given that it only cost about a quarter of a million dollars to go down on his sub, and for Musk to take someone to space costs about $70 million, he might have a point that it's more realistic to build things under the sea than in space. In reality, of course, just speculating that you're going to build cities under the sea is uh, utterly stupid. It's just more utterly stupid to speculate about doing it on Mars. Establishing a self-sustaining base on Mars. The future of mankind is underwater. It's not on Mars. We're not going to have a base on Mars. Or the moon. So then in 2024, uh, we want to try to fly four ships, uh, two of which would be crewed and two of which, two, two cargo and, and two, two crew. And yeah, claiming that you're working on absurd problems does not justify you simply ignoring safety rules that typically exist for very, very pertinent reasons. The industry standard just wouldn't allow for them to build what we felt we needed uh, and what we thought humanity needed to explore the ocean. And absurd is right. None of these people have the resources to build a city, let alone a self-sustaining city here on Earth let alone the idea of building one under the sea or on Mars, which will be orders of magnitude more expensive. I'd like to be remembered as an innovator. Um, I think it was General MacArthur said, you're remembered for the rules you break. Meanwhile, the SpaceX of the sky is currently angrily making the exact same arguments that Stockton Rush did about, the, about how the bureaucracy simply couldn't keep up with such a innovative company. The next flight Starship is ready to fly. We are waiting for regulatory approval. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it, it really should not be possible to build a giant rocket faster than the paper can move from one desk to another. <laughs> <laughs> this might actually pass as an argument if he didn't launch a hundred or so rockets per year, and not bother mentioning the bureaucracy once. The bureaucracy he's whining about is about Starship, three out of four flights of which blew up or lost control minutes after launch. You know, maybe if Starship didn't, on average, blow up quicker than you could eat a cheeseburger, regulatory approval might be easier to obtain. Maybe Musk should focus his efforts on actually making Starship a work rather than whining about the regulations. But the main difference here, of course, is when, when Stockton Rush was skirting the regulations, his life was on the line. When SpaceX is petitioning to launch a 100-ton vehicle at about eight times the speed of sound, and if they lose control of it like they did with the um, first flight or the second flight or the third flight, we know roughly how fast it would hit the ground from the fourth flight, which is about two to three times the speed of sound. That is, an out-of-control starship is a 100-ton kinetic penetrator artillery round. In fact, here's a cute energy calculation. We can calculate the energy of the Titan implosion, because at the beginning there was a void of water some four kilometers below the surface, and at the end, that water had been filled. But, of course, to do that, water had basically, on the surface, lowered. So we can ignore everything that's basically the same at the beginning and the end of the calculation. So it's basically the equivalent of dropping the volume of the Titan sub of water some four kilometers. So if we said it's about a cubic meter, a uh, 1,000 kilos, and it's dropping 4,000 meters, Multiply those two together and you're up to 4 million, and of course gravity is 10 meters per second squared, so you're now up to 40 million joules. 40 megajoules, with a kilo of TNT being roughly equal to about 4 megajoules. So the implosion of the Titan sub was roughly equal to about 10 kilos of TNT, going off in something about a cubic meter in size. An out of control starship weighs about 100 tons, and while in orbit, is traveling about 8 kilometers per second, 8,000 meters per second. So its energy is easy to calculate, it's half mv squared. 
roughly equal to some 800 tons of TNT, about a kiloton, one twentieth the size of the nuclear weapons that were used against Japan, or a hundred or so of the most powerful conventional bombs that the US Army currently has. And if it slows down to about, yeah, I'd say, two and a half kilometers per second by the time it hits the ground, it still hits the Earth with the equivalent energy of a hundred tons of TNT. Doubt my maths? This is basically the proposal of the Rods from God weapon scheme, where some 10 tons of kinetic penetrator traveling just over three kilometers per second has the rough energy equivalent of 10 tons of TNT. So a starship would be 10 times bigger, about 100 tons of TNT. 10 times bigger than the largest conventional weapon the US military has. And this is the main reason Starship hasn't gone to orbit yet, because of regulations. The next flight Starship is ready to fly. We are waiting for regulatory approval. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And I think it's a fair bet to say that without those regulations, you know, saying that no way, you must put this thing on a suborbital trajectory. Because at least that way, we know the wreckage won't kill anyone. Because without those regulations, yeah, I think Musk would have gone for orbit every time. After all, why should regulations hold back such an innovative company? And you know, I'm probably with the regulators on this one. Now, sure, a random out of control deorbiting starship will about 50% of the time land on the Pacific. But it's a roll of the dice. There is absolutely nothing to stop a 100-ton bullet traveling at give-or-take railgun-type velocities, landing on London, Tokyo, Paris, Munich, New York, whatever. Put simply, when Stockton Rush argued that the rules simply didn't apply to him, he gambled with his life and a few other millionaires. When Musk does it, he's gambling with everyone else's life. You know. Yeah.